Welcome to the Women Want Strong Men podcast. I'm your host, Amy Stuttle. I believe it takes a strong man to appreciate a strong woman, and I'm here to bring a unique perspective to empower both sexes. I love talking with health experts, thought leaders, influencers, and people who have insightful information to share with us about our health, our society, and our pursuit for success and prosperity. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On today's episode, I have Dr. Rob Kamenarek. Dr. Rob is the president and owner of Renew Health in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Rob is also a part of the AMMG faculty. AMMG is an organization that provides training to medical providers on age management medicine. So this is where I saw Dr. Rob. When was that, Rob? In April-ish, I think. Was the yeah, me in April in Miami. Yeah, yeah, so I saw Dr. Rob there, heard him talk, heard his sister actually present as well. He has a lot of great knowledge, and I thought he would be a great guest on the show here. So welcome to the show, Dr. Rob. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be here. So maybe let's just start with telling people a little bit about your practice, what you specialize in, what you're treating there at Renew. Sure. So what my focus is on, which is not necessarily the patient's focus, but it changes when they get here. My focus is on longevity. It's helping people understand how they can improve their health span to ultimately improve their lifespan. And the part that they're almost always interested in is, is the big muscles and skinny waist. And that's usually what gets the ball started. Either that or they've had some kind of scare, right? A mother, brother, dad, somebody had a heart attack or a stroke. And they don't want to have that. Or the third one would be they've started testosterone therapy and they've really messed themselves up and (laughs) they want to get fixed. So it's usually kind of one of those patients. But it usually turns into like, hey, let's look at the bigger picture. What do we really want? And almost everybody universally wants to feel good every day and jump out of bed, have their feet hit the floor and be ready to go and go chase down life and have a great day. And then what can they do about their longevity? So if we can get their health span and their health improved to improve their lifespan, you know, that's a huge win. So you're seeing men and women, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. It's about a 60-40 split. Okay. And you're doing obviously a lot of hormones. Yeah, quite a bit. Okay. Quite a bit. Do you have a preferred delivery method for men and women? I don't have a preferred delivery methodology. And any doctor can make any delivery system work. I do what's best for the patient. So that may involve injections. It may involve transdermals. It may involve orals. I used to do pellets years ago. I stopped back in the 2008, nine. And for me, it just didn't settle well. I've been doing them for about a decade. I don't really, the procedures were interesting, but physiologically, your body doesn't make hormones that way. And there's all kinds of other little unwanted side effects that over time begin to be problematic. So I I moved away from pellets. I know there's people that love to do pellets. Pellets work great for certain individuals. And you can make that delivery methodology. If it's your primary, you can certainly make it work. It's just not mine. I prefer transdermals and injectables and orals. So if you're doing the transdermal, let's just talk about, I guess, the men first. Are you doing transcrotal or are you having them apply on their arms? Where's your preferred area? So if you look at the studies, and there are different areas you can certainly apply to, but the best absorption comes off transcrotal. So the big issue there is, is to make sure that you're manscaped because you don't want to be treating the hair. You want to be treating the tissue of the scrotum. So I find over the years, and I would say all my counterparts as well, is that transcrotal cream is the best way to deliver transdermal creams. So. We nicknamed it here ball butter, if you just if you want to use <laughs> that in your practice. <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, right? That, like sounds, you, like you a, can, that yeah. sounds like a very Midwestern way to put it. You know, let, me, to put, let me put on my ball butter. <laughs> uh, what about for the women with the testosterone? Do you have them applying that vaginally? It depends what the goal is. So everyone has different, some women prefer not to use intimate parts. They'd rather do behind the knee or the forearm. Some women like paravaginal, other women's like vaginal. And it depends what the issues are. The women are much more complex when it comes to hormones than men. There's a lot more management. There's a lot more issues to have to deal with women, whether they're pre-menopausal or, or post-menopausal. There's just so many other issues. Sometimes I use injectable. It depends on the goal. And in others, I use oral. 
So okay. uh, whatever works best with the patient is the delivery methodology I'm going to use. I know you run SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin for the listeners that don't know. You run those on your labs. I'm curious if the SHBG steers you one way or the other on your dosing, and why do SHGB levels fluctuate? So they can fluctuate for multiple reasons. The nutrition that you're on, male versus female, age, liver inflammation, health of the liver. There's so many different reasons that sex hormone binding globulin can change. The easiest way to get past it with higher levels is to just drive right past it with testosterone. That's certainly the easiest way to do it. There's other methodologies that you can use by detoxing the liver. So one of the things that has caught my interest in the last decade is with all, and I know you talked to Rudy about these things. I'm sure you talked quite a bit about all the toxic chemicals. And certainly the things that I've seen in the last decade with respect to younger men, when I started doing uh, hormones in the 1990s, I very rarely saw levels below 5 500, 550. It just wasn't commonplace. And I very rarely saw young men to where the last decade, almost everybody's under 35 and have horrible levels. And wow. there's a lot involved that comes in play with detoxing individuals and clearing out their methylation pathways and getting the liver performing better can certainly make a difference. One of my goals with a patient is, do we really need to start hormone therapy? Do we have to put them on testosterone? Because there's different methodologies we can use from enclomiphene to biologics like HCG and then even using testosterone, the big tool in the toolbox. But what if we're able to recover an individual earlier in life and keep them off of therapy? Well, I will say, you know, testosterone is the big tool in the toolbox and I prescribe a lot of testosterone and it does wonderful things. What can we do for the younger individual to maybe keep them away from such a therapy if it's not needed? immediately. And oftentimes when we detox them off their antipsychotics, their antiolytics, their ADD medication, maybe marijuana, alcohol, you'd be amazed at what the hypothalamic pituitary system can do, what the liver can do when it's optimized. And oftentimes you see in those younger patients that those are many times the problem. And for me being somebody who always seeks the truth What else is it that we can do where we can keep them away from therapy, testosterone therapy? Because it is a commitment. It's like being a diabetic and going on insulin. And the younger you start that, you may never be able to come off of that therapy. And having to be dependent on something doesn't sit well with a lot of individuals. So maybe clarify that because that is a question that we get a lot. If somebody starts on testosterone therapy and then comes off of it, what's going on in their body? Because I think a lot of times they're under the impression that they're going to make no testosterone when they get off. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, that's not true. So once again, depends on the individual and what the starting point is. Will they ever go back to something better than their baseline? Probably not. So if their baseline is low and they're on therapy and say for whatever reason they need to come off of therapy for severe unwanted side effects, let's say, for example, they'll return to their previous baseline somewhere in that number. And then there's other therapies you can try. But the older the individual, the less likely some of the initial steps are going to work, such as selective estrogen receptor modulators or biologics which is why I've always been an advocate of taking a stepwise or stepladder approach where you try the different therapies first. If you fail, well, you know what else is left, right? We tried HCG. That just didn't accomplish the goal. We tried enclomiphene. We couldn't get symptom resolution. And that's good from a medical legal perspective as well because, listen, we trialed these previous therapies. They failed to resolve the symptoms, so now we move to testosterone. So from a physician standpoint, you now have a nice medical legal stepladder approach to therapy where you didn't commit somebody to what is still, you know, a controlled substance early on. And I really like taking that approach with younger patients under the age of 40, you know, who may want to say, for example, still have children, right? Well, we tried these therapies first and they failed. 
So, so we really don't have anything else to use. So our medical director also did his training at Cynogenics, which I read on your website that you were there as well. So he early on did a lot of HCG monotherapy, but I'll be honest, we didn't have a ton of success with it with our younger guys. How high are you having to dose that and with it being reclassified as a biologic, are there cost restraints around it now for your patients to be able to get the dosing they need? Yeah, that's certainly a problem. Cost has gone way up since we can't get compounded HCG any longer. And I forget what the cost is, but it's up there. So it's, it can be cost prohibitive, especially for the younger clients. So that does make it an issue. It does work well. Florence Comite, who did a ton of research at NIH with HCG in young men, you know, an expert at using HCG, it certainly works well. It doesn't work for everybody. And, you know, there's issues with building up antibodies to it and, of course, expense. So, in the end, you always end up towards testosterone, which has a very well-known usability, has a very well-known side effect profile that you can avoid, and it's inexpensive, and you definitely get results with it. So without a doubt, it's the best medication to use in the end. So let's sure. talk about some of these precursors, DHEA and pregnenolone. Are you supplementing those? Yes. Do you always have to? No, there can certainly be an argument that, well, listen, if you go on testosterone, you're eventually going to have to use these and you shouldn't be just optimizing one hormone. You should be optimizing all the hormones, which I would certainly agree with. There's always going to be those individuals that don't get the negative impact that testosterone has on the neuro and neuroactive steroids, pregnenolone and DHEA. And just for the listeners, if they don't know or to, to reiterate, so Pregnenolone and DHEA are both produced by cholesterol being converted into pregnenolone. And at that rate limiting step of cholesterol passing over the inner mitochondrial membrane requires LH, luteinizing hormone, and to kick off the P450 side chain cleavage system and have all the conversion that takes place, you need LH. And when you go on testosterone, you end up inhibiting the production of your gonadotropins, LH and FSH. And without that, you may not convert, may not go down one of the three pathways, the endosterone pathway or aldosterone pathway, cortisol pathway, or androgen pathway. And what happens is you just don't make pregnenolone and pregnenolone gets broken down into DHEA and progesterone and allopregnenolone, allopregnanolone, alloprogesterone. Those three are referred to as the volumes of the brain. And what can happen is the pregnenolone levels can drop off and suddenly individuals have problems with nervousness, anxiousness, maybe even panic attacks. And because pregnenolone drops off, DHEA can drop off as well. And you need DHEA. It keeps all those inflammatory cytokines in check. So... That can be one of the problems of being on testosterone. Every now and then, you'll run into an individual that when you put them on testosterone, it blocks their cortisol pathway and their cortisol levels drop. And that can be scary because it'll precipitate an Addisonians-like reaction where they'll start having profound abdominal pain and circulatory collapse. So that does happen. Not very often, but it's scary. Is there a time of day that you recommend people take those supplements? Because there was somebody at AMMG what the that goal wanted. goal is. Okay. So we know that if you have DHEA, right, you supplement DHEA, especially in the evening, it'll boost growth hormone secretion by about 20%. So I like DHEA in the evening. The problem can be is for some people, it wakes them up and then they can't sleep. But if you can tolerate DHEA in the evening, that's certainly great because you will boost growth hormone secretion. Pregnenolone, a neurosteroid and a neuroactive steroid as well, really does help with sense of well-being, mentation, can help with calculation, memory, recall. And some people feel the loss of that when they go on testosterone. And so you can supplement pregnenolone in the morning, afternoon, evening. It's not excitatory as DHEA can be. Now, are you supplementing women on either of these things as well? If need be. There's always one of those guys, you can load them up with a ton of testosterone, their DHEA and pregnenolone levels never move. They still stay there, you know. So I was curious, what kind of testing are you doing? Are you running, obviously, these labs, you're monitoring it, and when are you making the call when you're going to supplement it? Are you looking for a number? Are you looking for a symptom? So it depends what I see initially in the labs. I look at 33 different hormones and their metabolites. So I take a very comprehensive approach to hormone therapy. And when you alter one hormone, you're going to alter others. So you really need a good baseline of what all their hormone metabolism looks like. 
Some individuals from the get-go, I'll go ahead and supplement because they're already deficient and it needs to be optimized or they already have symptoms. Other people, I'll wait and give it two, three months. It all depends what I need to do for the individual. So I don't do anything that's cookie cutter. Like, okay, everybody goes on this plan. This is where everybody starts. And it might work great for some people to do that, but that's not something I've ever done. So I want to ask you about birth control pills and women that have been on... (laughs) Yeah. So let's hear your thoughts on it and the impact it has long term on women and how you if they make the decision to finally come off of those, how are you reversing the impact that it's had on their body? Yeah. So we could talk for hours on this, honestly. So birth control pills and so many doctors put young women on birth control pills. So let's say like 16 to 45 is kind of that age group. Right. And no one ever gives the thought the fact that when you put a woman on birth control pills, you're putting her in a catabolic state, right? So you're going to raise sex hormone binding globulin. You're going to bottom out testosterone, free testosterone. You're going to raise copper levels. And there are those women, their copper levels go up and they get kooky, right? And they're like, what's what's wrong with Angela? What what happened? She started these birth control pills and three months later, she's like a psychological mess. And those copper levels, you know, go through the roof. But the real problem is, is you're putting them in a catabolic state. And what are you going to do about putting them in that catabolic state? Because this group of women love to all do the same thing. Everybody wants to be skinny. So they overexercise and they undereat. So you've already put them in a catabolic state on birth control pills. Now they do what all young women do. They all want to be skinny. So they eat a lot of sugar. So the coffee and the energy drink mix, they overexercise. They all want to run. Nobody lifts weights. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but they they all run because they want to be skinny. Allie Gilbert lifts weights. (laughs) Yeah. Allie lifts. I love Allie. And then they grossly undereat and they crash their metabolism. And then they end up with all kinds of weight loss resistant issues and autoimmune-like conditions, and they crash their health. So birth control pills are the gateway to autoimmunity, are the gateway to weight loss resistance and thyroid issues. And I would tell you 99% of the docs out there, and I'm not speaking poorly of anybody, they just don't understand how dangerous birth control pills can be. It's a slow burning fuse. Yeah. I don't even think anyone in the medical community really understands. And a really good friend of mine who used to work in my office, Vince Pitstick, we used to talk about this back in the 2000s. And we didn't understand what we were seeing and we would talk about it and all these things. And he's actually doing a great job working with this particular subgroup of women, helping recovering them. Because birth control pills really do some damaging things. It's just not fast. It's really slow over time. Well, why are doctors so quick to hand it out? Like, even if it's not trying to prevent contraception, it's like, oh, you have acne, here's birth control. Oh, I mean, it's like, why is that our our (laughs) go-to? Because it works. Listen, I have a 23-year-old daughter and I've watched her start to have those. And I caught it early because the eye only sees what the mind knows, right? There's that saying in medicine. And I saw it early because I've seen it thousands of women, you know, and you're like, well, that's what's happening. You've got to get off this pathway because your birth control pills put you in a catabolic state. Now you're getting older. You're becoming more conscious of your body. You're trying to stay lean and she's already got a cute figure. Now she's under eating. She's over exercising. You're going to get skinny fat. Let's stop running. Let's start training muscle. Let's start eating up. Let's start feeding our body. Let's adjust the birth control pill to a lower progesterone pill so we can get away from some of these unwanted side effects from the progestins because these are synthetic hormones. They're not bioidentical like micronized progesterone. So there's a lot of difference between using these synthetics and using bioidentical hormones for sure. Working with females is very complex when it comes to hormones. And that all comes down to age and what's being used and uterine history, cervical history, mammograms, you know, breast history, all that comes into play. So. This is why my company name is Victory Men's. <laughs> so. oh. <laughs> Women yeah. are complicated. But, complex. Uh, yeah. But one more thing on the birth control, because I have friends ask me all the time, like, do you recommend a certain type of birth control? Like what type of birth control? Control should I put my daughter on? Like they're at this point in their life and they have a lot of questions about it. Is there a brand name or any more information you can give for the listeners that are in this stage of their life? Yeah. So the lowest dose 
monophasic that you can use. There's monophasic, biphasic, triphasic. There's a quadphasic. So I don't do contraceptive management. That's not my thing. But I end up having women come here that are on contraception. So we have to figure out, hey, what's the best way to go? Sometimes it's coming off contraception altogether and using a different form so we can calm the whole system down. But definitely using the lowest dose possible. The ones with the higher progestins in it, you definitely want to stay away from. And maybe let's just make one more thing clear. Going to an OBGYN to manage your hormones, and if they just put you on a birth control pill, that is not actually managing your hormones. I don't want to say it's incorrect because it all comes down to what you're after and what you're going for. So what's the goal? You know, a 20-year-old goes into the ob guy and says, I want birth control pills. That conversation is this. It's very right. myopic, right? It's focused on... Okay, what's the best methodology for you to use to prevent pregnancy because you don't want to have an unwanted pregnancy? It's, it's not the right time of life for you. No one's thinking, oh, this girl is going to go the social aspect of this. Oh, well, she wants to be skinny. She wants to have bigger boobs. She wants to date. So she's going to exercise. Her form of exercise is going to be aerobic, not anaerobic. She's not going to lift weights. She's going to grossly undereat and drink way too much Starbucks and have way too much sugar and get fungal infections in her gut. That's not part of the picture. That shows up much later. So it's a very difficult subject to address because it's when you go to your OB guy and your, your primary care provider and you're looking for birth control pills, that's the conversation. It's about pregnancy prevention, right? It's not going to be what comes down the road and what all the effects. Most people don't understand the, the negative effects of synthetic birth control pills. Right. Exactly. Okay. So one in three women, since we're on the topic of female, will die of heart disease. Does that sound about right? Yes. It's the number one yeah. killer in women. I think a lot to of times- To be specific, Amy, so okay. after menopause, one in 2.8 women will die from a heart attack or stroke. That's crazy. I mean- That's the data. That's crazy. And so, for men, it's one in three. So it's about the same, but men, it's earlier after the age of 40. It's pretty consistent, right? But for women, it's a little bit worse after menopause. So how is the hormonal change during menopause increasing their risk for a cardiovascular event? So if we just take the one hormone, we'll talk about estrogen, estrogen going to liver being converted to estrogen-free fatty acids, which deals with all the inflammatory markers that we see in the glycocalyx and the endovascular lining. That change right there, that change in the lipid profile and the acceleration of disease that occurs. So if you add on other things, insulin resistance, diabetes, smoking, being overweight, poor lifestyle habits, there's that acceleration of disease that happens postmenopausal that you don't have when you have all those hormones on board. So estrogen has an incredibly protective effect for the vascular endothelial lining, which is lost in menopause. So the best time for a woman to start is perimenopause, is to get on board with starting hormone therapy, testosterone, progesterone, and when estrogen finally waxes and wanes and inhibin does its thing and it falls off, then coming on board with estrogen sooner rather than later. We don't want to have that big time frame where 10 or 15 years goes by before they get on hormone therapy because there's so many negative things that are happening when they lose estrogen. The cardiovascular protection, the neurovascular protection, the cerebrovascular protection the bone and mineral metabolism. So all those negative things that start to happen. And I just yesterday had a consult with a very nice woman at 44 who when we put her on the DEXA scan and we took a look at her bones, she has osteopenia, the spine and the hips at 44. And her hormones were already in decline. So to get on board early on with growth hormone and testosterone, to put that bone matrix back in early to prevent Fractures, because the fractures of the spine and the hips and the immobility that come from that often leads to death within a six month period afterwards. So, but I don't estrogen think estrogen is incredibly critical for a lot of different systems. But I don't think most women realize that they need to be taking care of this in perimenopause. People are waiting till they hit menopause or in menopause to then decide to treat their hormones. But it's really this perimenopause phase 35 that, that women need to be. Yeah. Wow. 35 for testosterone for women. Usually in that time frame, they'll start seeing it drop off. So testosterone does a lot of wonderful things for men and women, right? So 
So I'm on testosterone, so I'm obviously a big fan, but maybe can you explain the conversion of testosterone to estradiol in, in men and women because we, you know, it converts in both of us? So the conversion of testosterone and can go down to the 5-alpha reductase, it gets converted to DHT and etiocholanolone and a bunch of other different ones, aldosterone and dosterone. And whether you have 5-alpha or 5-beta will dictate which you make more of. And then down the opposite way, we're getting aromatization into estradiol. And estradiol is incredibly protective of so many different systems in the body for both men and women. Like we, I just talked about before, the brain, the heart, the endovascular lining, your bone and mineral metabolism, all these things are incredibly important and you need estrogen for that. You want to stay lean? Guess what? You need estrogen. You need estradiol. You can't be without that. So there's a lot of different systems that require to have appropriate levels of estradiol. So I think there's one of the misconceptions with testosterone in men is that it actually increases your cardiovascular risk profile when it is the contrary. So I guess you just hit on it and the importance of this aromatization that's happening and why estradiol is actually cardioprotective. And just to throw it in there on good faith, this is why we do not block estrogen with something like an astrazole, correct? Exactly. Right. We don't want to be doing okay. that. We want to allow the aromatization of testosterone into estradiol. If somebody is becoming over-aromatized, and it does happen, there'll be those individuals that are a little bit more sensitive to higher levels of estradiol, and you'll get the symptoms of it. You'll get bleeding, you'll get bloating, you'll get breast tenderness, breakouts, mood instability, those kind of things. For men, erectile issues can start to show up sometimes when it gets a little too high. And the correction to that is fairly simple, taking a little bit of a drug holiday or dropping the dosage down so you can bring your estradiol levels. It very rarely requires the intervention with an aromatase inhibitor. In the world of hormone optimization, now you get into bodybuilding and they're using DHT derivative steroids and much higher levels. That's a whole nother animal. That's not what we do. It's not what I do. It's not what you do. It's not what we do in the world of hormone optimization from a medical standpoint. And those two worlds really shouldn't cross. So in our world of hormone optimization, it's not something that's necessary. So since we're on the topic of cardiovascular health, you wrote on Instagram recently, you had a JPEG that it says, despite so-called, quote, normal cholesterol levels, 95% of individuals on statins continue to have heart attacks. Yes, it's true. Ruffling does feathers. Not work for, yeah, it doesn't <laughs> work for primary prevention. It doesn't do a great job at secondary prevention either. And it's a very broad topic that we can talk certainly for hours upon, and it really needs to be addressed on an individual basis. I'll give you examples here. Oftentimes, I have individuals come into me and they'll be on a statin. Well, what do statins do? They lower cholesterol. And if you lower cholesterol levels, what else do you think gets lower? So you end up with medication-induced androgen deficiency, right? So they'll have low testosterone. We pull the statin away and magically in the next three months, their testosterone levels go back up. So it's medication-induced androgen deficiency. So the question is, why were they put in the stat in the first place? And more often than not, they've had very little testing. They had maybe a calculated cholesterol profile where they got an LDL and HDL and that's about it. You know, a triglyceride and it says, well, your cholesterol was 250. Yeah. So that tells me nothing. Right. So obviously now we got to get in, we got to take a deep dive because what does the family history look like and what else is going on that we have to be concerned about? Oftentimes people are making medical decisions about their health with very little information when you need to get more data. So I'm a proponent of it at the very basics, a nuclear magnetic resonance lipoprotein profile, ApoB, ApoA, ApoBA ratios. I want a homocysteine. I want a fasted insulin. I want a high sensitivity CRP. I want a vitamin D. I want HOMA scores. I want to look at the thyroid. I want to get an overall picture of what's going on. I want to know, are they an overproducer of cholesterol? Are they an overabsorber? Are they both? Are they oxidizing this cholesterol? Because I can show you examples and I see it all the time. You can cannot tell by looking at somebody if they're going to have a heart attack or stroke. I have had the most fit people walk into my office and we do their testing and they're an absolute metabolic mess. We'll end up doing a coronary CT angiogram and they have multi-vessel disease. Then I'll get somebody in here who's morbidly obese. Their labs look terrible. Every parameter is skewed in the wrong way. And I'm certain we're going to find tons of 
disease in their arteries and we find nothing absolutely clear. And there was a time in my career where I thought I could tell. You could tell. To 27 years now, I'm telling you, you can't tell by looking at people. And I had a fellow in here the other day, you know, had a stroke. He was 42, 43 years old. And you look at his cholesterol profile and everything, everything looks good. But when we took a little bit deeper dive, we found out that even though his HDL, all subfractions of his HDL in the green, all subfractions of his LDL in the green, no evidence of any reason why this man should be having a stroke, but he was oxidizing his ApoB. Now, why? And we took a little further dive. We found a few genetic defects in the background that were probably leading to the reason why he was oxidizing. So you just can't tell by looking at people. And people make decisions or have decisions made for them about going on these very serious medications with very little data. Yeah, they take it thinking it's going to prevent them from having a heart attack. So if somebody's listening to this and they're like, crap, I'm on a statin. I didn't have any of that testing. All that I had was my HDL and LDL looked at and made the decision to get on a statin. What do you tell them? Where do they turn? If they're not in Dayton, Ohio. (laughs) Yeah. Now, do I use statins? I do use statins, right? Do I prescribe them? Yep. I use them. They have a time and place, but they definitely need to be more strategic. Putting them in the water like fluoride, you know, like everybody should be on a statin. That's just bad. Yeah. That's bad advice. You really need to take a deep dive into your lipids and understand what's happening with your lipoproteins, which can certainly be changing over time, and then make a decision about what medication you would use. I had a patient yesterday who was put on a statin just because of family history, but when we looked over her laboratory, nothing really stood out. Then we took a much deeper dive and turned out the problem that she has from a family perspective is that family makes really high levels of lipoprotein little a, which is a type of ApoB lipoprotein that has a Kringle protease attached to it, and it's highly atherogenic, and she makes a ton of it. Well, putting somebody on a statin in that case, guess what statins do to lipoprotein little a? They make it go up. Wrong medication. So here she's taking the wrong medication for her problem because she never had the appropriate studies done in the first place. So interesting. We have a great cardiologist here in St. Louis, Dr. Twyman. Do you know him at all? Yeah, he's fantastic. Listen, there's great cardiologists in every city across the United States. This isn't some like hidden knowledge that nobody else knows about. It's out there. It's just, you know, getting to the right people to get the right studies. My problem is, is oftentimes people make decisions about their health with minimal data. It's like going to a testosterone clinic and being put on testosterone by only having a total, a free, an estradiol, and a DHT, and maybe a PSA. Yeah, That's not enough. That's not enough. I know that's what the guidelines say is enough, you know, the urology guidelines, the, the endocrine guidelines in different societies. Oh, this is all you need, and you only need to calculate a cholesterol profile. That to me is just inadequate. To me, the guidelines are so far behind the science. They're 20 years outdated. And that's not what I would do for myself. And that's not what I do for the people that I see. Now, sometimes there are financial restrictions that keep them from getting these kinds of tests. And it's unfortunate. But the reality is you have to pay to be healthy or you're going to pay to be sick. One way you're paying. So you got to figure out what your priority is and where you're going to put your dollars. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, getting testing done costs money. We were happy to find him in the St. Louis area, at least have a place for our local patients to go. And I just recently went through his whole workup. And you're right, it's a cash pay. It's not cheap. But, you know, I, I did a lot of the testing you just mentioned and a lot of great information there. So, you know, I have a baseline for yeah, myself. so you took a deep dive. What'd you end yep. up doing? You guys do a Boston Heart? Yep, we did the Boston Heart. I did the scan. Bing! Did that like, oh, wow, check out this. Yes, yeah. yes. It's so interesting because my dad has a genetic snip that where he overproduces the ApoB. So that's like something interesting. You know, he's been on a statin since 20, never knew his ApoB and little A levels. Like never. And I, this man's been on a statin for 40 something years. So it's like it's just really interesting information that we start to discover when you start to actually deep dive into that. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I bet you did. And that's a good thing that you did it. He's a good dude. I've never met him personally. I know about him. And I, I know plenty of people that have used him. And I hear nothing but good things. So I think I'll be at Ali's event in Houston. And I think he's supposed to be there too. Yep. So Yep, you're right. He's yeah. speaking at that Silverback Summit as well. Yeah. So I want to ask you about phlebotomizing patients with 
patients that might have secondary erythrocytosis and there's some confusion sometimes between erythrocytosis and polycythemia and then understanding is this patient at an increased risk for a stroke if they have higher H and H levels? Where do you stand on this? It's not a stance. This has been looked at over and over and over to the point where the hematology society put out a statement that testosterone induced erythrocytosis is not a problem, right? It's an expected and desired benefit from therapy. Again, in testosterone optimization therapy, not bodybuilding, not the abuse of steroids, not taking several different DHT derivative steroids for body dump. That's a completely different animal. In the world of testosterone replacement therapy, testosterone optimization therapy, that often gets confused. And testosterone-induced erythrocytosis is a desired effect of therapy that adds benefit. Now, are there individuals that can have problems with the increased erythrocytosis, increase in the hemoglobin and the hematocrit? Not polycythemia, polycythemia, the whole bloodline elevates, right? Which is a genetic, you know, when you can run a genetic test, a JAK2 gene test to test for that, and that's a blood cancer. That's something completely different. And I really have a problem with people taking the terminologies and saying it's the same. That's not. Testosterone-induced erythrocytosis, polycythemia, rubrovera, two different processes. Treatment can be the same. But when you have somebody on testosterone, the simple solution is to stop therapy, take a breather, and that'll bring the levels down. Now, there's some people that respond more than others. You'll see more testosterone-induced erythrocytosis with injections than you will with creams. But even with transdermals, people can have high levels. You can take a drug holiday. You can reduce the dose. And if necessary, you can use phlebotomy. And I have. It doesn't need to be done with any regularity, however. I did recently had a patient. He's older. And he started having erythromyalgia when he went to his home in Colorado. So he went from 932 feet to 13,000 feet, the elevation of his home, in a day. And he started having problems with shortness of breath. And a little bit of tingling in his hands. Well, the solution, hey, let's go donate blood before you go to Colorado. Because the elevation change for him in his 60s now, he's starting to feel it. So to solve that problem. But, you know, I also ended up running down a different pathway because my spider senses went off. Like, "Mm, I think there's something cardiovascular here too. And we ended up finding a pretty significant obstruction in his left anterior descending artery that we took care of. But the need for phlebotomy on a regular basis inside a testosterone replacement therapy program is really minimal. It does come up. Sometimes we do have to do it, but not with any great regularity. So if the patient doesn't have any symptoms, but you see their H&H rising, will you make them take a holiday from their testosterone or will you want them to phlebotomize because you're worried about attorneys or what their primary care doctors or will you just let that continue to rise? And as long as you're not having symptoms, don't worry about it. In 27 years, I can count on two hands the number of people I've had to send out because I'm like, ooh, those are kind of high. Usually it was pellet therapy. So they'll show up in my office, they're on pellets, they've had way too many pellets put in, and now they have symptoms of erythromyalgia or shortness of breath, and they're just completely, you know, they look like a beet, they're so red, blood pressure's up. And so we'll take a pint off or do a double red, and, you know, bam, all their symptoms go away, and then we adjust their dosage. So the answer is always coming to adjust the dosage. Because it's amazing how many primary care doctors that will get, like, panic over their patients just having a slightly elevated H and H on testosterone. Not necessary. And And it's desired. Once again, that's what all the athletes want. The cyclists want. Why do they take the EPO? Why do they take the testosterone? You want the increased hemoglobin hematocrit. You want to drive oxygen in the muscles. So having an elevation in the hemoglobin hematocrit does not increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. Well, look at Lance Armstrong, right? I mean, he was doping this on purpose, right? For the competitive edge. And so do many, 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 many other cyclists to this day. Okay, perfect. Well, it was great having you on the show. I appreciate all your knowledge and I'll attach all your website and your information in the show notes. So thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, wonderful. It's great. Thank you. 